Play it now on PC and console. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the HTC Mid-Season Brawl, as we're about halfway through our games for Group B today. And we have coming up next a, another barn burner, as it will be Red Canids going up against E-Star. I am joined at the Analyst Concave by Gilly once again, and we do have the good old addition of Kaldor and Fan on the way. Kaldor, I saw you going a little bit mental over there towards the end of that <laughs> game, and Dread had actually died. Yeah. like. <laughs> The last game, especially the last fights, were absolutely fantastic. The early lead with the hunt Illidan yeah. was absolutely cool to watch. And that sick kill against Li Ming, Zola just absolutely yeah. performing on Saratul. And I guess in the end, we all knew that he comes down to one void prison. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? <laughs> and they played it perfectly. That was an incredible finish. It had to. It had to be preordained to come down to the Void Prison finish. Yeah. Absolutely. So looking at what we have coming up, of course, we are going to be going to Red Cannons, going up against E-Star. And E-Star comes off the back of a very hard-fought and very well-fought victory yesterday going up against Team Dignitas. So that's got to sit them in good stead coming into today. Yeah, Red Cannons, uh, of course, having a little bit of difficulty. Jay Shritta tweeted out specifically that they had some issues with their macro game versus Tempo Storm. That was the almost near flawless macro game for Tempo Storm, especially on Sky Temple. But now they're guaranteed some team fights because they're placing, er, yeah. playing versus E-Star. <laughs> That's one rich. way to look at it. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So bring up, put on your aggression hats, boys. Uh, as obviously the Red Cannons on the other side, <laughs> they uh, they they had a bit of a rough spot yesterday for sure, uh, going up against their opponents. So what do they have to do now going up against East Side? Do they, do they just embrace the aggression here uh, and try and bring out something a little bit different, or what? What do you think answers for Red Cannons? I mean, personally, I think from a playstyle perspective that this is going to be a little bit more down the LA just simply because they love the team fights and yeah. Tempo Storm just didn't give them to them. They were outplaying them in the macro game the entire match. Now they get the team fights. The problem with that on the other hand is that Easter really showed up in their games against Dignitas. So mm -hmm. that is, if they perform on the same level, there's a completely different level of skill here where the cannons have just to step it up. Well, I'll ask you about that in a minute, Fan. But before we get to you, of course, we do have to introduce our first team to the stage as we do have Red Cannons coming into this next series. Our team's trenches are like a macro in a draft, I think. Mostly because we changed some players, two players, and they are not so strong mechanically in individual decision making. So we basically rely on the macro. The weaknesses are exactly that they are just told. It's like uh, um, we have to tell some basic stuff to the new players so they can do it. And sometimes it's, it's lowers too much and just the lack of experience. My biggest fear in the tournament is MVP Black because they can evolve a lot. They have a, like a, three very, very experienced players like with Mary Day, Sake and Kyocha. Winning MSB for me, I can't even tell you because <laughs> seriously, it's basically for me be the dream. They say it's the dream. The ever belovable team here from Latin America. We've seen many of them. And there is the muscle man himself, given even Caldor a rivalry, as it is Jay Shrita. <laughs> Always the ever entertaining guy. What can you tell me about Red Cannons, guys? I mean, you heard them say it themselves. Uh, they have two new players, might be lacking a little bit on the mechanical yeah. side. They said that, you know, they want to focus on macro. That might be their best shot against E Star. Look, after looking at the results yesterday, E Star's team fighting was on point. I was yeah, seriously yeah. impressed with it. So maybe they got to look in the macro or in the draft to try and out strategize them. Red Cannons got a lot of their comforts in drafts mm -hmm. yesterday. Gul'dan, they had the Anub Arthas pairing, which they love too, even Ariel. So if they're going to stick with that, then definitely want to see a step up in the gameplay with those now that they have some comfort on stage yeah. or some adaptation in draft, maybe even denying some of Sing C's best heroes. It's actually a really good point. Trying to target Xing Zi here a bit, and uh, mm. we saw his Vala completely pop off against Signatars. We saw the Greymane in absolutely fantastic yeah. shape. 
I think this is really where you need to try to make your play to make sure that you push them out of their comfort zone and capitalize on that because everywhere else, Easter seems pretty fantastic right now. We saw Kasura as well from them yesterday. Uh, is that something that they could potentially utilize here against an E-Star where some of these teams have traditionally or uh, actually had a bit more of a melee focus to their compositions? Could that work here? Possibly. If you're going to see something from E-Star again, focus heavily on like this double support with the Vala or even the Greymane again. Mm -hmm. A lot of things focus around Zing C and his yeah. uh, ability to play, pop off, like you said, Kaldar, <laughs> on these heroes. So if they're not going to ban it, then they definitely need to figure out a way to counter it. All right. Well, of course, we do have that other team on the other side of this matchup. It's the Chinese powerhouse themselves. It's E-Star. Um, the 就是多练多想 Achievement unlocked. The ever lovable <laughs> character of Zingsi there. Both of these teams fearing MVP. No real surprises there uh, when it comes to MVP Black. But what can you tell me about E Star with the evolution their roster has gone through again and again and again? And as you were mentioning, a lot does rely on Zingsi being able to show up. It does. Zingsi is the longest standing member along with Tiger on this mm. roster. Uh, they picked up Savage, who initially subbed in from Xiao Ti at the Spring Global Championship. Uh, the latest have been ZZH the support player, and then Lucian, too, to come in and fill out. Sorry, is this SW? I uh, got confused there for a second on the support. But the support and warrior <laughs> player are the right, newer right. players here. Um, and the synergy between them is, especially in the team fights, so impressive. Yesterday, Lucian showed an incredible Tyrael mm. and two different playstyles, too, with the judgment follow-through, as well as the more standard sanctification for the Grammy. So I'm hoping they get him again. I wouldn't worry about maybe like mistaking who's on the team it's because little, yeah, they SW, change like every ZZ. week. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty <laughs> crazy. Um, but overall, what else uh, really stands out to you? There was the win yesterday against Dignitas. Obviously for a lot of people that might have come as a bit of a surprise, but it's still E-Star. They're still an absolute monster of a team. It's still E-Star and we also, we always talk about Chinese as this it's a bit of a wild region, yes, and it's a yes. region that you always have to respect. But coming into the tournament, China was one of the regions where everyone said they are weaker than they previously were. And Easter just completely obliterated that as a rumor yesterday when they played against Dignitas. You ask the teams and everybody said, yeah, maybe Easter reaches the fourth spot in the ranks. And some even dropped them completely out after the first group stage. And then they showed up against Dignitas, take it to a victory and look extremely good doing it. So that was very impressive. And that makes them a very, very scary team in that group stage. Our maps are going to be Infernal Shrines and then Dragonshire <laughs> with Tomb of the Spider Queen banned by Eastar. And then we had Red Cannons banning out Battlefield of Eternity. Fan, I want to know from you, um, when you when you look at this Eastar roster, where do you think they can go and how much can they put on the table here at this tournament? You know, I think a lot of it depends on uh, Xing Si, the star player for them. A lot of people know him as one of the best players in China. He's mm -hmm. one of the last of the old guard of the E Star, the original E Star with Xiao Ti, uh, you know, Nai Cha, Xing, Xing Si. They were very legendary. At their peak, they were compared to MVP Black all the time. So yes. if he can perform well, they can perform well. All right, into the draft we go. Game number one does begin here as Rank Cannons go up against E Star Gaming. And we will be on Infernal Shrine. So what are we thinking to start things off? 
I personally am, once again, we've been talking about it. I'm looking towards what we're going to see on the side of Xingzi. So far, when we are talking about draft in, uh, in general, we have seen a lot of aggressive comms around Genji. <laughs> Uther has made his way up into the bans and early picks as well, just because he can complement so many heroes. First of all, we're talking Genji, we're talking about the Grey Main, you can go into that double support comp. But we have the Red Cannons already trying to shut Xingzi down by banning out the Vala, so that pushes him more towards the Grey Main. Yeah, is that going to be... Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yes. there we have it. <laughs> Perfectly done. So now for the first time we get to see what else Sing Si can play. Sometimes in the past we've seen some Zul'jin. Uh, Li Ming too as possibilities, although they need to make sure that they still have the ability to clear out shrines unless they're going to be just going for team fights first and then trying. I mean, as much as, yes, you've just taken away two of my favorite heroes, Sing Si, you've got to have a little bit of a smile on your face right now. It's like, <laughs> I'm that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely the ultimate respect to ban yeah. out to ban and then first pick two of your signature heroes, leaving up power picks like Genji for the other team. It's gonna be interesting. I mean there's two cool things with this. The first thing is of course we're not looking at Xing Zin and saying, hey, he can only play two heroes and he's bad and everything else. That guy is definitely good enough to make all this work mm -hmm. right now and just jump onto the next one. But you take two of the heroes away that you know he excels at and that he's very comfortable with. And while we have them not, uh, Red Cannons, not go into the Genji, picking the Greymane early is not really a bad pick on this map in particular. Course, yeah. You mm -hmm. have a great amount of pressure towards the objective. You have the kill potential then later on. So it's... I like this from the Red Cannons that they actually looked at the games yesterday and they said, okay, our biggest worry, Xing Zi, let's try to draft against him and still start with the Greyman and build a composition around that. The Auric ban comes in. Not the most common thing to see. An ETC ban as well. Also not the most common thing to see nowadays, at least. Yeah, two pretty unusual bans. Gonna have to assume that both teams did their research there. Mm. One ban I really wanted to see, and I'm still not seeing, is just the D.Va on Infernal Shrines. Mm -hmm. Eastar has showed that they're willing to pick it. They can pick yeah. it into like a dive composition. Uh, you know, D.Va actually, last time they picked it into mass melee, it works because he, she can thrust her in with the rest of the team. So I'd be on the lookout for that pick. All right, well, they're taking time about this. What else springs to mind here for you? I'm still looking at Savage. The Genji is sort of throwing me for a loop, which is why I'm taking my time uh, for E-Stars, trying to figure out who is playing Genji. Uh, I'm not looking at it. I'm wondering if that's going to be Sinxi's hero, and then uh, wondering what Savage might play too. But we're going to get an Abathur and an Uther. So again, that even makes me think even more that it's going to be Zingxi playing Genji now because the focus, again, revolves around that particular hero. This just scares the hell out of me when I look at this. Yeah, yeah. You have the combo. We've been talking about this combo for so long, like yesterday and also today. The Uther with the Divine Shield just enabling Genji. And then on top of that, you have the Abatha. First of all, for the copy. Yes. And <laughs> then also for the Symbiote. It doesn't get any scarier for a backline than that. It yeah. does, and that's Sank too. Or Judgment. Could be. <laughs> it's China after all. That's yeah, right, that's and China. it is Lucian, that's true. He does like to play that particular uh, build. The, the, the more I watch this draft, the more I think to myself, okay, you remove Vala from uh, Zingxi, you remove Greyman from Zingxi. What if he is on Genji, and then we just reveal this sickeningly good <laughs> third pick that he has available to him? Yeah, that's my main... Uh, I, I wonder if he's practiced on the Genji. If that's a Zingxi Genji and he's well-versed on it, it's going to be brutal. But here's the point. What else would you have banned? I personally would have said, okay, if you look at the second band that they have here with the ETC, I would probably have tried to get rid of Utha instead and make sure that they don't get the combo with the Genji. But when it comes to the first bands, does really anything stand out that is so threatening on the side of Easter that it rivals the pressure that Ching Z can execute with either Greyman or Vala? I mean, I guess we'll have to find out. I, I do think mm. Genji can rival both of those heroes mm. if played extremely well. So we're going to have to wait on the execution. I mean, regardless of who it is, the Illidan came in at the end there. So it could be that as well, which is equally as kind of scary in my mind. Um, but overall, looking at the compositions, what do we what do we make of them? How do we <laughs> feel this will play out? E-Stars is as E-Star as you could hope to have, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Tyrael, Uther, Abathur, whether it's Judgment or Sanctification. Then you add Savage's Illidan and Xingxi playing a hero that is hyper-aggressive mm -hmm. and can make plays. So pumped. I'm so pumped. 
At least there's things like Twilight Dream. There's Horrify for the other side, Red Cannons, to hope that maybe they could stop this aggression with right, these right. big heroic abilities. But even still, I would be scared. Well, we've got to go with predictions, uh, Gilly, as you can start us off. E-Star. E-Star? Okay. What did we hear in the interview? Tyfix was talking about the players not really being on that level just yet, not mm -hmm. having the coordination. If you have a Genji and Illidan with Abatha and the Tyrael in your face, <laughs> I think that's where you crumble. I say Easter. Okay. Yeah, I mean, fun fact, back when MVP Black was in their prime, when they were on like a 60 plus game winning streak, no one could take a single game off them. It was absolutely unheard of. The first game they lost was to E-Star, and E-Star was running Illidan, Abathur, Tyrael. So those are odds I'm willing to bet on, going with E-Star. All right, well, thank you very much, guys. Of course, make sure to be voting out there as well. Uh, we should probably check in with what's going on. And E-Star's winning. <laughs> Well done, well done indeed. So it seems that we have red cannons that are, did get their gul'dan towards the end. It is one of their comforts, but will it work out as we go to game at number one? It's going to be Dread and Grubby bringing you this one. Let's go. Hey guys, again, yeah, with me is Grubby. We are ready for E-Star versus red cannons. And you know, those drafts were extremely offensive. I, yeah. I, I'm just so excited to see this come in this game. I just thought you were felt insulted by the draft. <laughs> yeah, they're they're aggressive, that's for sure. Such an E-star draft, you said. But let's take a look at the left side team here first in the blue. It's going to be Red, Canids, Jay Shritto on Greyman, Viera on Malf, Hamtaro on the Haka, Typhax on Diablo, and Lithosaurus on Gul'dan. And in the red is going to be E-Star Gaming. H is going to be on Tyrael. Jing Chen will be on Genji. Tiger on Abathur. SW is going to be on the Uther. And Savage here on Illidan. And so, I mean, you know, fan reference to MVP Black, the era, and how it kind of died to E-Star, not only with the Illidan, the Tyrael, and the Uther, but the one thing for me is just back way back in spring the composition that won that championship was created by e-star and it was very very close to what we see now it was the uther it was the tyrael but it was going to be the gray main the five man death ball all in and i think genji and illidan perfect replacements for that i'm so excited to see them play this comp yeah it's such an aggressive composition here by e-star definitely not something you see a lot of teams exactly run like this together with genji and illidan but very cool to see that coming out. Lots of invulnerability and armor as well on the side of Eastar. And they're going to need it against the double silence action from Gul'dan and Malfurion and the Apocalypse combination by Diablo. I got to say, I like that Diablo pick, but I could see you did not agree with me. Yeah, the Diablo pick, we had a bit of a conversation, and it relies around basically why I struggle with the Diablo is because both of us, oh, wait a minute here, oh, Jay Shritte Jay getting Shritte. caught out. Make a run for it. He doesn't make it, man. Beautiful hat coming out there. That is going to be the first kill here for E-Star in this game. You know, and this is what we've seen Illidan's and Genji's. That is what they want. We always know anytime you have that, if you're isolated, that is where those guys are going to thrive. They need to move together oh, as a group. man. <laughs> okay, okay. I kind of see what Genji can bring. <laughs> Whoa, hold on. There's H down. Nearly get Malfurion as well, but that was pretty mad. Yeah. He's got Gul'dan with self-healing capabilities with Drain Life, but he's got a standstill. They're far in the lane, granted, but it's a two versus one and a half. That's Genji with an Abathur hat, but he can't get away. No, he very much cannot get away. And it's, it's the mobility of this composition that makes it so punishing. You know, it, it, it's very unforgiving is I think the best way to kind of term this composition it, because again, the one right click a little bit too far, they suddenly go, oh, thank you. All press the R buttons, all hit the go button and uh, your health bar pretty much dissipates immediately. All right, yeah. And, well, let's see if the red cannons can adapt to this. They're gonna move in to the shrine now, starting to get a few skeletons, but nice for Eastar, they get the first few. Abathur in the meantime, getting infinite value at the bottom lane. There. Big charge there on Tyrael, but he gets out for now. Viera is in a tough spot, and he actually ends up going down. That's the first kill, but H follows quickly. The uh -oh. passive from Tyrael is gonna explode, doing so much damage, and Savage looks like he is gonna have a heyday cleaning up this fight. Even Jing Chen surviving, dashing over the wall. Five for nothing, two minutes in this game. E-Star looks on fire. I think that's a mid-season brawl record. I don't think there's been a five-man wipe yet after two minutes and 30 seconds. E-Star is on fire right here. They're going to get the Punisher. They're going to be close to level seven by the time they get that Punisher. Look at this death trap. They thought they saw a chance on H there, going for Tyrael, but it really turned sour there as they tried to chew off more than they really could. There we go, that five-man wipe. 
And now it, it's led to so much control onto the map. Eastar not even finishing the Immortal itself, or, or excuse me, the Punisher itself. They're worried way more about getting the camp staggering or stacking the objectives because they realize there is no world where red cannons can apply enough pressure to clear 33 of those while well, they are only going to need two. So I love this patient play, waiting for their moment because this comp is good in small skirmishes, levels one through nine, and, but it's good at team fighting at 10. It cannot full 5v5 pre-10 very frequently unless a huge misplay like we saw in to the last fight. Okay, so the delay in itself is nice to get to that level 10 point, but of course it also means that they get level 7 talent spike, which means they can get more out of this Punisher, and they're starting to go on Diablo here. Go, go for the rest. Illidan's gonna get out for now. Savage. He's not done. He's gonna keep going. The smite giving them the mobility. Typhax looks like he is not going to be able to survive this situation. That is the first by Hamtaro with the burrow. He gets the drag onto Uther, but SW, he manages to survive the circumstances and Jing Shen trying to get that poke out. He goes in Uther, now in ghost form, has those heals, and now Savage and Jing Chen are pretty much just going to clean up here. Punisher still has been removed, but they have the night camp pushing out. Savage! He savage. makes it. He makes it out. What a savage. Meantime, Uther completes his quest while in his devotion form. The Harker goes down. This is a 10 versus 2 takedown situation. Yeah, and now four and a half minutes in, almost a three-level lead. E-Star looks just absolutely angry here. And this is again. So, like, it's a throwback to what we used to see out of the Chinese region pretty much up until the mount changes came into play. It was just five-man death ball aggro. I mean, it, it started the meme of Chinese bush meta because they had so many melees. They were just like, we wait for you to come to us, and that's where we start our fights. Lethosaurus is apparently overextended on his own hemisphere of the map, about his own one-third of the map. Apparently, that's not okay. So, got to kind of uh, redraw the... <laughs> Offside line. <laughs> the it's boundaries. Just, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not flat way between the turrets and forts. East Star is like, no, nah, uh, it's right about uh, past your core. Yeah. Hey, anywhere Don't else? stand behind your keep. That's too close. Illidan could use that to jump on you. Yeah, and 10 is now going to be online here for East Star. What do we see when it comes to the heroics? Any major adjustments? Judgment for that extremely offense. Not even going for the same Sanctification, which again, with these type of play, used to be Sanct, but now a new version here for E Star. Judgment hunt. and the hunt. Oh, All man. right, so we've got Dragonblade the hunt. It's just been used at melee range, and Lithosaurus can't catch a break for now. He catches a break. Wonderful. He does he manage to away. survive. We see the clone actually being oh. used. On to Genji, Typhax is not the target they're gonna want, but they do end up going in onto him. The clone doing so much damage. There's the first dash, there's the second. No reset for Jing Chen. He goes in with the Dragon Blade, trying to make it work, but the suplex might have been enough. Oh, there's the G the shield. Divine shield. <laughs> that was dirty. That was wonderful. Genius. It really looked like Xing Chen overextended. Got it caught like a silver leak, Genji. But the truth was anything but that, as Uther was close enough, gets the Divine Shield, he gets the resets and Swift sweeps his way the heck out of Dodge. And now just returning to the original thought that we had, talking about the Diablo pick. It's now going to come online, the reasoning why I typically don't enjoy that. I love the kill potential onto the shrines, but into Tyrael. There is no heroic choice that Diablo couldn't take where Sanctification would not counter it, but there's Hunt, or excuse me, Judgment. So now that Diablo problem, out the window. They have the opportunity to go into the Sanctification, but there's a sec, or excuse me, into the Lightning Breath or into Apoc, but Apoc is deterred by Guardian of the Ancient King. There's two things that make Apoc just not good because of that armor. You, they line up, you intentionally get hit, one Frisbee, and you are invincible as a group. <laughs> So let's see if they can first stun Uther, make sure he's part of that Wombo combo. If Uther himself gets silenced or Apocalypse at the very same time that several of his allies do, that could potentially be the window of opportunity here for Red Cannons. Now, they're trying to go for Tyrael. Remember when they tried at the Shrine? It turned around on them, and Genji is closing in. Nice cleanse oh, oh, oh. on Gul'dan, the silence. They all show up out of nowhere, and Lethos taking the damage oh. out. They do use the clone, but now that is already Gul'dan dead. Viera is now in a bad spot, drops the Twilight Dream. They end up using the Apoc as well. The stun goes down. Tyrael ends up dying, but the passive ends up locking in Viera there with the hunt. And the hunt, yeah, takes down Malfurion. No ice block yet on the map, of course. Diablo goes down. That's a reset of his souls. He goes back to zero. Does mean he comes back right away. But I assume he would have liked to extend his hibernation a little bit if it meant more survivability with those souls. This is going to be hard to farm back, especially with how Eastar has been dominating the lanes. Uther goes down. 
But, you know, it doesn't really gain them that much per se. What they need is to take control of the map, and it's difficult for them. Yeah, it is very difficult for them because, again, they we find E-Star being very patient. Interesting choice here, actually, to cap that. Uh, the patience that they showed, it made sense for while they were up on top getting the clear, but when Uther dies, they yeah. have 10 seconds. There's no way that Red Cannons has the opportunity to gain the same talent tier, nor, you know, take the fight without Uther there. So now, essentially, E Star volunteering for this four versus five. They just go in again, just hit the oh. go button, no hesitation. <laughs> Hold on there, E Star. Dang. Going straight on Diablo and Malf. Don't even need Uther, don't even need survivability. This is just insane. Punisher still 80% life, and they're going for the keep. And now, uh, looking at Red Cannon's composition, legitimately, it feels like the only way they can turn around what is a very snowball game for Eastar. It's just going to be the counter momentum heroics have to be used, and they have to remain grouped. They split to Haka, looking for that side soak, but every time they're four versus fouring, you can't win against Genji's. I'm telling you, these high fee compositions thrive in non five versus fives. Yep, we saw that. They didn't need Uther. Backing off now at the right time. Got the keep to Half-Life. And look at all those yellow things oh, on the map. They First don't know. Three oh, Shinxi gets away. And Dangle misses by about half a mile. <laughs> Very <laughs> what mobile is that? What is that in terms of, like, right-click distances? I, you know, what is half a mile according to my screen in the World of Heroes of the Storm? A half a screen. A half a screen yeah. is half a mile. So one mile equals one screen. <laughs> Presumably. That's interesting. <laughs> that what? makes these characters pretty damn giant, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're right, that's actually very creepy. Right, he misses by 700 pixels. All right, so now the engage is going to be here. It's 16 talent here, nowhere to be found. Apocalypse is used, only hitting H. Desperation for red cannons. The hunt goes over the wall. There's a lot of damage on the material, but he uses the divine shield. Horrify, splitting Savage away from the fight. Lethos gets punished by the judgment, and now that is the first fight. E Star are just Ooh. turning it up. <laughs> he tried to go through the terrain. Genji stopping at 40% of the mark with that swift sweep. I I really didn't expect this. We've got two takedowns here on the side of E Star. Red cannons salvages the situation. And that really surprises me. He started just running against the wall, quite literally, just time. It's actually really interesting because we saw the initiation before. They didn't wait for the Uther. They said, screw it, we'll take the four versus five and just obliterated with it. But then, again, when it's the five versus five over, a, even without 16 talents here, they ended up losing that initiation somehow. Another force here. It's going to be the hunt. This is two versus three for now. Nowhere, nobody else is there. They got the Abathur hat. And it shows the power of this cop. Look at these guys. Yeah. They just ignore everyone else. Apparently, you can ignore Daka and Diablo and just go straight for Gul'dan. This is so Grey gross. <laughs> well, plus, the armor he's able to achieve, you can't crowd control him. Otherwise, he gets the armor. If you don't crowd control him, he does Illidan things. Here's the thing. You go up against Illidan, and granted, it was just a genius last pick by Easter. You go up against Illidan when there's an Uther, you must bank off of blinds. You yeah. cannot use hard crowd control, because Uther will just make him in Invincible. So you would need blinds, and there was no more space in the draft. I mean, there was no time here, and it was last pick. Yeah, it's a really good point that you bring up because it, it legitimately, cool it's just not even, you know, really able to stop it because that is the counter, you know, to Ilden. We know that always historically. You have an Ilden. What do you need? Like Brightwing. I need the Polymorph. I need like a Divine Storm. Some kind of hard crowd control to be able to manipulate this hero. It's Guardian no longer is, possible. Yeah, it is not a thing here. Welcome to a new meta, Uther. I mean, we knew it after the rework. He would be, I mean, game-changing to the meta because just purely off of his passive and having Divine Shield, that alone in hard crowd control for a support is always a huge thing. Makes him so, so very viable. But then Guardian of the Ancient King, the new answer to cleanse, kind of. Yeah. Uh, it's just amazing, really, to see this talent in play and the synergy with Illidan. Uh, you, you look at... You look at Red Cannons' as mage player, he goes for the standard build. The question is, is that the best one? Hunger for power. He takes less healing. Oh, oh Horrify misses. Bad. I mean, it's all about protecting the backline here, and they're having a really tough time. Exactly, and now not having Horrify, that is one of two counter momentum spells. The Apoc, the Twilight Dream, and the Horrify all are things that are great into hard engage compositions. They move in, they funnel, you use the counter momentum, that's where you win those fights. One of those now offline. We've talked about the problems with Apoc. If Uther's free, that leaves only Twilight Dream. So smart plays here. Just, just gonna go and take this keep first. No risk at all. Moving on the second one, and that means they're threatening to end. 23 takedowns to six. There we go with the hunt. Glenn's on cooldown. No problem. Savage gets out. 
Judgment goes in there. There is going to be the Apocalypse. Every go buddy going down the Holy Ground, splitting people, but the silence there on Deterio. They do end up getting the first pick. Did E-Star go too far? Divine Shield, the Dragon Blade. Jing Chen just ripping through the health bars of Red Cannons, but they do not get a pick here. Five versus four. Red Cannons, they want it so desperately, but 20's been picked up here for E-Star. Yep, level 20 has been picked up. Means Illidan has both of the storm. Uther doesn't mind dying because he has redemption. He's going to be coming back. And in the meantime, he's giving armor oh. and healing. The bait there with the 20 picked up into the redemption. They get the kill onto Uther, and that is not the target <laughs> they wanted. Healing everybody here into the skirmish and opening up what will be the end of this no! game. <laughs> he goes down. Malfurion! <laughs> nope. In the end, E-Star, 27 to 8 is going to end this game. Yep, that's the most takedowns, the earliest five-man wipe, and one of the most fun games of the mid-season brawl yet. Day 2, E-Star naps that first map. Just awesome. I, I, you know, I, I'm glad that I could bring my excitement to this and then really just show why. E-Star, there was no moment where it felt like they were concerned about which part of the map was theirs. They were just like, do I see an opponent? If so, let's go. It's so awesome. But Red Cannon's here the entire game. So much pressure, always so split and so caught out. You know that they are worried about just the aggression next game. They find they have to be able to find a way in the draft to stop that for E-Star. And it started at level one. Like the way they just stood in that top push in the middle between the two lanes, the bottom one just waiting like, go ahead and try the lane. Try to play a normal game. We're not going to let you it's, the entire game. It's even what it seemed like they were doing on bottom. You know, it's like, go ahead, try and get the kills. Oh, you got Luther. Uh, thanks for the redemption. We're going to be right on back. <laughs> Either way, it was an absolutely amazing game for us. Let's see what our analysts had to say about it. E-Star on Infernal Shrine seems to have created the Large Hadron Collider composition here. I'm surprised they didn't discover <laughs> the God Particle during all of that. That was insane. I felt like everything was smashing into everything. That was the most fun <laughs> I have had in the last couple of days. That was brilliant stuff. That was a treat to watch, Gilly. Dude, that was just about the epitome of what I think of like the true Chinese hero style, right? The just full aggression right from the beginning. Five man team wipe, two minutes, 30 seconds into the game. They had a three level lead before 10. It was impressive. It was so much yeah. fun. I mean, I just felt bad for Akinitsa at that point, and not only for them, also for our observer. That felt True. a bit like a tennis game. The entire time you're just one kill, other direction. You have judgment, you have Hun zipping from left to right. That was just brutal. Yeah, brilliant to watch, fan. Yeah, I mean, this E Star is giving me goosebumps. It really reminds me of the old 2015 2016 E Star. Yes. And that E Star, the thing about them that was really special was their ability to execute so perfectly in a team fight. It felt like they're a hive mind. It feels like five people thinking as one. And even when people get low, they don't panic. Um, they had that, that, that's what I admired about them. You know, the C9 of 2015 mm -hmm. did not have that. MVP Black does not have that to that extent. It's just when they're on, their team fight is so good. Yeah. I was saying the same thing to Gilly actually whilst we were watching it. Yeah. It felt like the E star of old. And it feels to me that at the moment, looking at them here, they are at possibly one of their peaks. One of their peaks. But Fan, I believe that you do have a replay for us from that game. Yeah, I could have pulled like 15 different <laughs> fights, but why not start with the first one? So loading in here, if we could just um, pause real fast here. So you can see in this screen, the cannons are the ones that actually initiate this. So they start off and they go on the Tyrio and the Tyrio does not panic at all. He's in a four versus one situation. E Star calls the target. You see, he throws his sword, he's stunned on the wall and we can keep playing here. Just look at how cleanly E Star focuses targets. Right here, they determine Mouth is the target. Every single member immediately jumps onto the Malfurion. They have the Genji, gets the reset. You you can look at uh, their Tyrio there. He just does not care. He does not back up, he does not flinch he keeps auto attacking maximizes the amount of damage they can do in a fight and mm. every single one of them even though they get low you can see they do not run away they they know exactly what they're doing in a team fight being low hp does not phase them yeah very impressive stuff there coming out of yeah. E-Star. I mean, especially with that comp, you want Tyrael to die. He's the one yeah, sacrificed true. lamb. Yeah. You want to get that trade value. His job is to go in, soak the damage, die, explode, and the team cleans the rest up. So that worked perfectly for them in every single fight. The yeah. closest thing I can compare it to is when we had 
ages and ages ago, Virtus Pro going for the Anubarakterial blood for blood blow up comps. It kind of looked like that, but this is a far more insane version than that. It looks yeah, crazy. Yeah, it reminded me too of the time at the Summer Global Championship mm -hmm. when you're picking Protection and Death. And it's been a long time right. since then. Uh, but giving that giant shielding to your team in this way, he's enabling Genji by giving getting people close enough that he is able to get his resets and completely clean up the fight. Another hero that does that beautifully, Illidan. It was yeah. such an awesome composition, but a rough one to deal with for Red Cannons. I mean, absolutely want to see it again. I'm not saying like this next map, <laughs> but during this tournament, please give me more of that because it was crazy. Now, Red Cannons, were, as we go on to Dragon Shire here, so as the game progressed on, they did start to gain a small bit of traction, get some kills themselves. But was that off the back of them slowly figuring it out or is the back of E-Star just going absolutely ham and just not having too many cares about it? Yeah, I think at least some of it was that. I mean, I was talking about them not panicking when they're low HP, but it goes far more than that. You know, they're willing to engage the four versus five situations without yeah. their Uther. You know, they're willing to, without hesitation, dive into like three versus fives, and they end up winning every single one. All right, on into the draft now for Dragonshire. Kaldor, what are you 